Welcome to the Sundance Watch List on Intercut, the yearly show going through all of the movies, TV, and shorts that people won't be able to cut away from. This year in Docs, we had Dakota Johnson voicing a disappearance, we had tubas going missing, lost memories, hell, even a whole video store vanished. We also found out about how coal is king in Appalachia, the chain of mental anguish for hospital chaplains, and why the King of England called cameras a fantastic machine. As always, I'm your co-host Arturo Zurita, and joining me to watch more movies than Curry Throws Threes, it's Zachary Shevich. What's going on? It's so good to be here talking about documentaries. You know, a lot of people get excited about Sundance because they get to see all these new features, all these new yes, narratives sir. from great directors featuring great actors. We have the Oscars coming up soon and four of those nominated documentaries premiered here last year. I feel like we have got some potential Oscar contenders Easily. for next year Easily. among the crop here. A lot of really good yeah, docs. Everyone's coming in to see these movies that are thrillers that mm -hmm. are like at the edge of your seat. The ones that are real, <laughs> that, that were like just filmed in the past year, going through like the craziest stuff. Those are the movies that have probably been the most visceral experiences out of Sundance. You're mentioning the four from last yeah. year. One of those that made me cry, House mm -hmm. of Splinters, got a nomination. It's actually out in theaters around now. So hey, perfect. Another recommendation. So if you don't want to wait a year for some of these documentaries, <laughs> uh, we have a whole list of these that... Uh, Many of these were available online, and that's probably one of the yeah. best parts about this year is that we were both able to catch some of the documentaries in person. Mm -hmm. You had like a really good Q and A for years. Yeah. Um, the matter, the matter of it is that it's easier to catch a lot of these at home, especially mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a, a film festival where everyone wants to catch the yeah. narratives. Well, this gives them a great outlet for, to be seen. I we, think. Uh, with our recaps, as you can tell from doing you know several hours of these by now, uh, we we try to see as many films as we can and oftentimes you try to prioritize the narratives for that in theater yeah. experience but like when you do know that there's a great documentary and you do get to see it on the big screen like it can be that much more impactful when and you like, fell in love with their last work you're gonna be exactly there. yeah so like i knew that if there's a new luke lorenzen documentary i was gonna be there in person Easily. There, there's some films that had like subject matter or maybe even people attached to them that i knew got you to make the sure you Johnson, saw them in the theater yeah. exactly uh but we have a bunch of good great stuff uh we're gonna be separating it into three different groups. Right. I always like to talk about the documentaries that should be caught, you know, at least in streaming. I don't think there's any bad docs. Mm -hmm. So the lowest group is still worth catching when it's streaming. The next one I think is worth catching when, you know, it's out available VOD. to rent on VOD. Yeah. And then of course we have our top documentaries. So many that I'm looking at an overflow of 10 here. The <laughs> yeah. top 10 documentaries. Exactly. It's labeled top 10 in the, do in the document, but it's a little more than 10. That's just because they're so great. Yeah. Uh, so let's just jump into it with the streaming documentaries. I don't think I gave anything really below a three, mm -hmm. but Zach did actually see <laughs> the first one that we have here. So I'm starting with the worst of the yeah. worst. But look, this not according to IndieWire. Not according to IndieWire. This was in the top 10 docs. I have absolutely no idea how. It's so bad, I don't even have a link for it. But here we go, <laughs> starting off the top 10. Zach, tell me about Pretty Baby Brooke Shields. Uh, Pretty Baby, Brooke Shields, it's coming to Hulu not so long from now. Well, the main reason I deprioritize it. Exactly, yeah. Sometimes you don't want to like waste your time at Sundance with something we know we're going to see in two months. Yeah. Uh, Brooke, but it's a pretty standard celebrity bio doc, right? Like, and Brooke Shields has lived an interesting life. My, my uh, hang-ups hang -ups with this documentary is not in, related to her story in any way. Mm -hmm. But it's just a very common glamorous kind of, t or, or like, you know, telling of this that centers like her uh, being like a brave person through it all, you know, okay. because she's so involved in it. She's a talking head throughout it. And it's like interesting to see her career lined out this way. If you have like even a passing familiarity with her, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot like to that's learn. revelatory for yeah. you. Because this was another one that was 136 minutes. Yeah. I could fit in like three world docs there <laughs> besides having to hear Brooke right. Shields' story. Well, it's actually, could be out. it's actually a two episode show, one of those types of documentaries. Oh, that's that they, they made it a movie for Sundance. Uh, I'll allow it because there's another one that did it and I didn't <laughs> like that one. Yeah. But. I mean, it's not, it's totally like watchable, especially if you are interested in Brooke Shields, but like okay. it, it's basically sh shows her career and then tries to basically be like, this is like, Mm -hmm. the uh this is like a 
powerful uh, story of feminism and how she yeah. da da da. It's, it feels like it's maybe making like her career a little bit too grandiose, mm. but I, I don't know. Well, it's an interesting film, but not not as interesting as many of the other documentaries you got to see. On the yeah. as well. Beginning the list, Pretty Baby Brooke Shields, like Zach said, this is going to be on Hulu in a little bit. It's, yeah. it's right around the corner. On top of that, this comes from the director, uh, Lena Wilson, who did Miss Americana. So if you like that one from Sundance, right. another one where we felt did the exact same exactly. thing, where she was like, everything's it's, on my shoulders. It's a promo, promo for yeah. the celebrity at its center, uh, which whatever, but like. So uh, Lana Del Rey, if you need a director, I believe Lana <laughs> Wilson is available. Moving on to the next one. I was so excited for this one. Such an intriguing story. Kim's Video, yeah, a, a blockbuster-like store that was super independent in New York City. You said you never had the chance to go to it. I, yeah, I mean, I think it, its heyday was a little bit before I was like going to Ready video to, yeah. stores in New York City. Uh -huh, you know, breaking like, up the rental prices <laughs> on that. But this is a movie that is almost like a heist film because it's this guy, the director, who feels like he's going to go without any permission to take back all of these lost rentals and then also find the guy who was running the store. I was so intrigued with it. And the movie's not great, but it gets you in there it, it, through a perspective where yeah. it's jumping into different movie scenes and, and you're following this guy get into like mafia ties mm -hmm. and all these different things. Zach didn't like it as much. And then he pulls out a rope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought there are interesting elements to the film for sure. But I think the thing that sort of caught me off guard from the beginning is like, it's <laughs> ostensibly this documentary about Kim's video but they spend very little time talking about Kim's video, yeah. the store. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it ends up being sort of this investigation to what happened to all the movies that were in Kim's video mm -hmm. after the store closed. Uh, and that part of it, there's hot highs and lows to it. Like there's a lot of it where he's just sort of running up to various Italian men and shouting That's at them. really and, what he does. He just yeah. pulls up on people, which don't ever do that when you're filming a documentary. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, the other aspect of it was, as you mentioned, that he like tries to secure a release for these videos through through this like kind of, you know film inspired sequence that actually feels pretty badass and pretty cool. It's intriguing. It it made the it was like a high point in the documentary, kind of exci exciting moment. They're wearing like director's masks and stuff for this. Yeah, 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 yeah. As they're cutting to the director's films and such. So like, and he's all he, he does this thing which. I mostly found annoying where he's trying to shoehorn in all these film references. It kind of culminates there. It sort of works. But as a documentary about Kim's video, it does sort of feel weird and sparse. And then we see this thread from Jason Bailey really going into uh, all the reasons that somebody <laughs> who was actually a Kim's video customer yeah. had frustrations with it. Also somebody who knows somebody trying to make, make a it. more legit version of the Kim's video documentary. Yeah. And like he, he admits that like he's got his personal biases towards it. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of his criticisms really ring they true don't. with the documentary. It's still like decently entertaining to watch. It's kind of a weird, weirdly formed documentary and that yeah. it feels more like a personal essay than like a, uh, a look at the history it's of this point. iconic place. But yeah, if you're looking specifically for a, a film about Kim's video or video stores, I don't think this is the documentary. Yeah, uh, this is definitely one to catch on streaming to kind of get you a little bit into what Kim's video is if you don't know about it. But I, I agree with Zach. I like that you said personal essay because mm -hmm. there are some really good personal essays. There's some really good journalistic documentaries, yeah. some really good experimental documentaries. Uh, and, you know, one's going through an artist's life. This ain't even a personal essay. This is just a man vlogging yeah. sometimes, getting himself into trouble. I've been talking about uh, one that's sort of, not a biopic, what would the word be? A profile. Yeah, on profile somebody. doc. Judy Bloom Forever. Or a bio doc. Bio doc. There we go. This is a bio doc that's as standard as it could be. This is the year where Judy Bloom is coming out with a bunch of different movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret's finally getting so released. I am so freaking excited yeah. for that. Uh, I'm sure they'll do Super Fudge at some point, but <laughs> this really is the most basic recap of a doc. Like I'm yeah. just being honest, it's not a bad doc. Some people will really like it because they really like Judy Bloom. Mm -hmm. I also really like Judy Bloom, but it's a basic doc. It just goes through the beats of like, she wrote this book and here's a talking head and what it meant to them next. Yeah. And then it's like, they would bring different things to defend her in terms of like, you know, you know, Judy's books. There's not that much diversity. It's like <laughs> nobody really, I think, is going for that. So they hire right. a guy to just say like, no one's really reading Judy for that. And I'm like, it feels like it's like you were saying with the Brooke Shields thing. It's trying to fill in the pieces and answer any question as a really quick 93 minute profile on Judy Bloom. 
Uh, but it's not her forever doc. I think that there is way more in-depth stuff, and I think hopefully with her work being adapted, you'll actually get some some good basis into what she was bringing as an author. It's not a bad documentary in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I don't know if you had the chance to watch this one, but no, I saw a little bit. Uh, you were just, wa I was watching yeah. over your shoulder, and mm -hmm. like you know, it seems very standard, and maybe like I, I know I so Judy Bloom as opposed to Brooke Shields is somebody that I maybe know a little bit less about her personal life, so maybe there's more that I would take away from it, from that from that one than like the Brooke Shields one. You know what However, I mean? like it, it's also the kind of documentary where it's like, well, do you really need Samantha Bee's opinion on Judy Bloom? Do no. you really need to hear from Anna Conkle on Bro. how Judy Bloom changed her life? Like it's kind of cool, but it's also not really it's getting not really into what it. I needed to. You know those VH1 things where they bring a bunch of celebrities just to recap you about the 80s and yes. the 90s? This is the Judy Bloom version yes. of that. Uh, I'm not sure when this is coming out. Mm, I, it's Amazon Prime, so it'll be on the horizon. Literally streaming for y'all, uh, probably in the first half of 2023, but we'll see. Coming to probably Netflix is the most Netflix by the numbers breaking down of what was the most intriguing story I felt in the world document or the U.S. documentaries. Um, the cult at the end of mm -hmm. the world. Had high hopes for this one, dude. This was a story where this uh, cult was built up throughout the late 80s and the 90s using anime. Like half of y'all are gone if this was happening in the United States. Uh, it gets into the nitty gritty of like what was going on in Japan and what allowed the cult to continue to grow in this very Scientology yeah. uh, space because they were really trying to get into the fabric of, no, we are not just faith-based, we are, we are to a degree a science. We can make people feel better until they started promising people that they could float. Uh, they were able to dupe a lot of people uh, and they duped us into thinking this is gonna be one of the best docs out there. It's not bad, again. Yeah. But it was really by the numbers. You caught it first and you kind of warned me about that. Yeah, I mean, it just ends up being this sort of, it, it looks like a um, assembly of a lot of previously reported on footage rather than something that really gets in there and is getting to the For bottom a of the story. story like this? Yeah, and it's oh, like, I think sometimes when you have this true crime type of story, like you really want to feel like the the investigation is like happening or like yeah. that they're they're actually uncovering material this felt like the wikipedia version of it all it, and it, like sometimes a wikipedia documentary can be helpful and netflix is netflix making a lot of money off of hulu as well as very big in that game this movie will do well once people get a chance to see it but it's not the reason that we come to sundance to see documentaries we're we're looking for people who take something that's may, maybe more innovative approach or, or a more daring approach mm -hmm. to material like this. Not a bad documentary. Not a bad Pretty documentary. standard though. Uh, also a little fun fact over here, uh, he's not pulling up there, but as a producer, they got Ben Schwartz on there. Oh. The Ben Schwartz. Sonic himself. So we'll see. <laughs> what kind of connection does Ben Schwartz have to the uh, I Bro, it could um, be a different cult. Ben Schwartz for all I know, but Ben Schwartz was in the credits. <laughs> um, the Cult at the End of the World, coming maybe to a Netflix near you. All right. The next one up is Plan C. You may have heard of Plan A. I've heard of Plan B. Plan B. <laughs> this is Plan C. Right. What happens when everything else, uh, all of the other options are gone? Director Tracy Droz Tragos has made a previous movie that won Sundance uh, called Rich Hill. Won the Sundance Grand Jury Award. Mm. Uh, and has also told a lot of other stories uh, dealing with abortion and abortion rights. This one was interesting because it's able to get at a really big array of perspectives when it comes to taking this specific pill, because it's not necessarily the procedure. It is a pill that they're able to sneak across state lines or getting yeah. people to come in and pick Plan it up. PlanCPills.com exactly. or .org, I forget. Yeah, they one. have like a whole website there and yeah. they kind of show you the different perspectives of people who are coming in, not just to get that procedure done. There's also a perspective of the doc dealing with people who want to make sure that those who want to give birth do it in the most appropriate way possible. Mm. So uh, I know that every single festival is always going to have a reproductive rights documentary. This one's pretty, pretty tall. Yeah, and I think the thing that's also interesting about this is it really embeds you with the people running Plan C yes. and what their lives are like. Because for some of them, it's kind of like ordinary activist work. But for others who are operating in and around states where uh, uh, abortion proceedings are illegal and pat or pills like this are yeah. illegal, like the, it becomes a lot more of a covert operation mm -hmm. and making sure that you Size. do, yeah, you, you do it a certain specific way. And like seeing the, the, uh, toll it takes to actually keep maintain this operation keep it up and help these people it is the interesting plugs, bro yeah <laughs> it's like the craziest form of a plug but, yeah uh last year had a movie called the james it was a documentary that's on hbo uh, i think that one's even above this one and there was even um call j which yeah. was the narrative version starring <laughs> elizabeth banks elizabeth banks yeah. thank you 
Uh, I'm not sure if that's streaming yet, but I those are also they might events. both be on HBO Max. I could be wrong. No way. At least the Janes is. The Janes is for sure, but yeah. uh, I would recommend those from last year as well if you yeah. feel like it's interesting. Uh, moving on to the next one. This is a personal documentary. Yeah. Junam, uh, one of the earliest films that we got to see at the fest, uh, and it comes from Sierra Urick, who I think has done a couple of uh, art department jobs. Like she's worked in the industry a long right. time, and now has been able to create something here where she's looking back at her mother mm -hmm. and her grandmother. Uh, and Junam specifically is a Farsi term of endearment. Right. And we were talking about this, bro. When they do the different font language for for titles like this, there was a couple <laughs> of other ones that were in the fest. It mops English. English yeah. looks so boring. I don't yeah. care what font you have. Ar I mean, Arabic writing oh is basically my. like calligraphy. It's yes, yeah, yeah, it like looks it's, fantastic. Yeah. It doesn't matter uh, what the title was. Uh, this one has a very beautiful logo as well. And the story is very intimate because it's her going back, not only trying to learn a bit of her culture that because she's American, she didn't have, but it's really made up of something that I think for the most part is going to uh, make it or break it for people and how uh, connected they could be with it. Because it's really made up of the moments when they're setting up the camera. Mm -hmm. And her mom and her grandmother are making quips. It's yeah. those little moments where she's trying to get into a story, but the mom won't let her. Exactly. That's what makes a documentary. Yeah. Um, the Just because this is a, a more famous filmmaker, uh, it reminded me of uh, Chantal Ackerman's last film, uh, the, the person who made John Dillman, but her last film was No Home Movie. And it's another film where she is doing kind of like home recordings of her mother. Okay. And, and you know, it's a, it's a certain style, right? Like similar to her style in John Dillman, there's like a very patient way that they kind of will set the camera up and let things sort of unfold. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes like you start watching a shot and like the substance of that shot doesn't really occur until a minute or two later. Yes. But like, it, it does sort of feel, like gives, gives you the feeling of like being in the room with them. Easily. And like navigating these conversations. And like, it, particularly this is also a film about her trying to get stories from her grandmother, you know, before she can't get these stories anymore. And part of the experience is the difficulty in getting these stories. So like, she really does put you in her feet in yeah. a way. And it might not it be the most like, rewarding, traditionally speaking, documentary, it's but it's a really fascinating one. Mm -hmm. uh, so Juno, put that one on your radar. Yeah. Pretty decent. Uh, the next one that we have is a world documentary pitched, <laughs> pitching itself as a documentary therapy session. Yeah. Thing here. Uh, it is called The Longest Goodbye, and it began originally as them trying to get this mission to Mars and trying to like just observe what the mission was going to be. Then they met the psychiatrist who was working with these astronauts in order to make sure that they stay sane. Mm -hmm. And it really becomes this entire just, uh, you know, the whole first man um, training that comes to it. That's all this documentary is. Mm -hmm. It's seeing through all of these uh, tests that they're going through, would they be able to make the right decision before you spend all that money to send them up there? How right. isolated can they be? Will they go crazy on the Mars mission? It was pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. A lot of really great shots in this movie as well. Mm -hmm. In space, no one can hear you on a buffering screen. <laughs> um, I, it, it's interesting because it's a different look at what space travel yeah. can do, right? Like we're often so focused on how hard it is the to get body, up there, yeah. how different space is, but like, we, yeah, the psychological toll that it would take good. being iso socially isolated, like that. Yeah, uh, watching your your kids grow up through like uh, jittery buffering screen stuff. Bro. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so it, there, there's a lot of fascinating stuff there. I think maybe the film itself felt a little bit like piece by piece rather than like a longer story. If that makes any sense, it's like he's yeah. checking off like oh they, they tried this. Uh, exercise and they tried bringing in this person and somebody thought what if they can put them to sleep and, yeah you know I, I think I was hoping for maybe a little bit more of like a, a complete thought than like the scattershot approach but it's all really interesting stuff especially if you're interested in space travel agreed because it's an hour 27 yeah it's pretty and pretty easy to watch documentary <laughs> the longest goodbye is probably the shortest <laughs> one uh, but it's still pretty decent I'm curious to see uh, follow ups to this because I'm sure they're not the only one who are covering a Absolutely. lot of these uh projects the next one is as i was saying one of those series where it is multiple episodes i mm -hmm. want to say this was three. showtime yeah we got it's, three it's coming out on showtime uh and i thought it was very 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 well done mm -hmm. it is called murder in big coin that looks at a lot of the young indigenous women who just just go missing yeah and then when they do appear it's like now we we check that spot <laughs> uh it gets into a lot of the intricacies in terms of like how do you build up an economy made up of indigenous people 
who have their own set of rules, yeah. but then also kind of have to abide. Mm -hmm. You know, they're coexisting, but they're really abiding by whatever these other state laws are uh, that are trying to take over. And, you know, there's a lot of jurisdictions where there's uh, enough leeway for you yeah. to not be able to get authority to help you search for somebody. Uh, and then the documentary does a great job of also looking inward and breaking down the cycles of what has happened to this point, totally. where you know someone's to blame, but they've set it up in a way where it's letting them destroy themselves so that they have the cleanest hands. Uh, the director for this, Razel Benali, also worked a lot on Dark Winds, which is a really big show on AMC. So uh, I would recommend this when it's on Showtime, and I think that's probably the best way to look at it, because they, they took their time in making it a series without having to rush it into this 90-minute story. Mm -hmm. And there's also a narrative which we covered. Well, I was going to say, yeah, we have this thing at Sundance where sometimes you'll see one thing and there'll be a perfect companion piece for I it like in the that. fest. I like that. Keep yeah. doing that. That's so really cool. uh, the U.S. Dramatic section has that film Fancy Dance, which we I talked about in our previous recap. Bit. Yeah, and they, they cover a lot of the same things in that how when there is a crime or a disappearance of a of a, a indigenous person off the reservation, it becomes this uh, competing... It's like an international jurisdiction. Yeah. yeah, where there's the reservation police and then there's the federal police and then there's the local police and they all have to kind of figure out who's actually responsible. And a lot of times they all just sort of shrug and don't this, claim this, responsibility. This, and, that's exactly and, right. and, and this, uh, like, this obviously takes a more, you know, uh, true crime kind of centric approach to yes. it. It it does feel, at least stylistically, like of a piece with stuff that is on Netflix, that is on Hulu that we've talked about. But I think the substance they're covering is a lot deeper and a lot more thoughtful and they get these really... Uh, revealing interviews, particularly with people who are really involved with yeah. some of these cases. And, and I think that's what maybe transcends it beyond the typical true crime doc yeah. is that there's a, uh, a, a, you see the emotional connection a lot more deeply. And, and I think it also dives more deeply yeah. into the subject than maybe something that's a little more boilerplate. There's that bit with the father too that, yeah. that that's carried through. So I would say it's a little bit above a Netflix thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe Stylistic not exactly more HBO. Than, yes. Showtime. Showtime, perfect. That's exactly where it's going to be. Actually, Paramount Plus with Showtime. Oh my gosh. No, there's no with anymore. They're, <laughs> they're going to become one. Uh, they've been dragging so long, they just announced it. Like, I feel again yeah. that, okay, now it's official, official. So Paramount, Showtime, whichever one you have, it's going to be one and you'll be able to catch Murder in Bighorn. Uh, this next one was one where I was just like, I don't know. I don't know if this story is going to fully be able to embrace this love letter to the uh, community of people with disabilities. And going into it, I had my expectations low. It starts off, the documentary is called, Is There Anybody Out There? It follows the filmmaker, Ella Glendening, who is trying to see, is there anybody else out there with the condition that she was born in? In particular, uh, the way that her thighs and her feet um, have been formed. The way she has trouble walking, and there's all of these surgeries that kind of get uh, tossed to people who have the same disability. And at the beginning, you know, she's a little bit of a stubborn person. Mm -hmm. And I, I was kind of like, all right, this person's going in and choosing, hey, this is what I want for my life. This is uh, what I'm looking for. I'm seeking somebody else out there who has the same condition as I do. She may or may not find somebody, but it may not be to, <laughs> to the liking of it being exactly like her. But then the second half of the doc shows a lot of growth. This is a documentary that shot over four years. And uh, this is another personal doc where it's really a journal that she's keeping of just trying to see uh, when she was young, she didn't see herself as different. Right. And then she grows up and the world tells her she is. Mm -hmm. So then it's her not thinking that she stood out and then trying to find who else can be as similar as her. The second half, without really getting into I'm sure the trailer will show more. I thought it was actually kind of freaking beautiful. Hmm. And it shows her growth to a degree of what happens when you expand outside of your viewpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the first half, <laughs> it, it, it almost didn't have me, but then I, I really like what she was able to tell cool. with the second half and how it's something that's bigger than her own personal journey. So is there anybody out there, uh, another movie dealing with disabilities, just as last, last year's, um, didn't see you there? Yeah, I didn't see you there. Which one of the award winners. Yeah, that was one of the award winners still doing his, its run right now. So if that one interested you or this one, put that one on your horizon. Totally. The next one is going to Netflix, Ooh, right? Already? Victim Suspect. Another one that because it had the Netflix pickup, we thought, all right, it's going to be really by the numbers. Another surprise as well. This comes from documentarian Nancy Schwartzman, who previously did Roll Red Roll. This is on Prime. I don't know if you've seen this. A uh, lot of football. No, team. I haven't. Yeah. And she knows how to investigate them down to a T. I should have known that, that she was going to keep that same energy here. This is a documentary that's showing you the journalistic perspective of what you got to do L.A. Noir style. All right, if I say this, they're, they're, they're done with me. So right. I gotta tease you just enough to get the info that I need. Mm -hmm. And it is frustrating. You remember the show on Netflix, um, Unbelievable? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the doc version of that. Interesting. This is how so many things get lost in the rubble and on purpose mm -hmm. because they just decided to, to not listen to it. Uh, this documentary does a great job of looking at a double standard one way. Oh, he's just a boy. Boys will be boys. And she flips that when she's investigating for one of uh, uh, their individuals, specifically because it showcases how someone who's a victim makes a claim and they go, I think you're a liar, so that's a false claim. Yeah. Now you're a suspect. Yeah, it seems specifically focused on how the police will, will take people who should be uh, receiving justice and brings justice down on yeah, them. Yeah, you instead. have so many stories. Someone calls a cop and the cop ends up coming at them. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is that movie in terms of a lot of uh, women who have been dealing with SA. Yeah. Victim suspect, pretty good title for it. Um, I, re I really liked it. And this Absolutely. should be out on Netflix if I'm not mistaken, but catch Roll Red Roll over on Prime because that's also a really good doc that has the same approach. Nice. Invisible Beauty, wrapping up the top three over here in the streaming ones. Mm -hmm. Invisible Beauty covers fashion icon Bethan Hardison, and it goes through everything that's happened to a lot of black models or agents in modeling. Mm -hmm. Zach, it's not good. <laughs> uh, let me pull up some of the notes that I had over here. It was crazy to just hear the different things that they denote in the back. There was one point where uh, uh, her whole approach is that she's not here to bring anybody down, right? right? As someone who's dealt with so much BS, she's not trying to get rid of other models. She's not trying to put anybody down. She's trying to pick everybody up. I like that approach to her. It was also interesting to hear her talk about how she forgot a lot of the things she said. She's like, wow. That was a really good quote I said back in 1990-whatever. Um, it gets into the idea about all these luxury brands that did not want their clothes to be on black bodies. How uh, there were a lot of agents who knew right away that when they were dealing with certain things, uh, certain seasons, they didn't want certain models there. Uh, I think it gets into the nitty-gritty of it. And personally, this is one where at 115 minutes, they talked about a seven-hour cut and a four-hour cut. <laughs> this should have been a miniseries. Um, I'm not sure who picked this one up because it's still being shopped around, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, one thing that I've noticed, which we haven't touched on yet, is that there's been fewer pickups out of Sundance this <laughs> year. Good pickups. There have been, and some there's big been ones. There's pickups. But uh, there's still a lot of films there's seeking lot distribution. Of films. Yeah, so hopefully this one gets a release. And again, I hope that we get to see a version of the Seven Hour Cut because yeah. it, it's all made up of an anecdotes and... Yeah, I think those should have been out there as well. The uh, directors and editors also worked on stuff like Halston. Mm. So if you've seen Halston, a yeah. very fashion-centric movie, obviously. Dior and I, another uh, fashion-centric one. They've got this down. So at least it's nice. documentarians who, who know the subject matter. The last two, I don't know if you got to catch any of these. I Wooden didn't country. catch. All right, I'll keep these brief. Yeah. Wooden Country, it's about what you eat. It's so standard and by the numbers. I've heard this a dozen times in YouTube videos. But look, this really is the best version. Someone's going to see this and be like, oh my goodness. It's one of those. Yeah. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just get into like organic foods and the farms and hey, you know, they really treat these animals bad and mm -hmm. the ecosystem. It also gets into like, yo, why is there only scraps over here? There's a movie that played this year at Sundance yeah. that's got a specific line. Why are all the grocery stores six hours away? So six miles away. Six miles yeah. away. It's for a purpose. They want us to eat junk. This is a documentary that gets into all of that. And uh, again, I think it wraps it up beautifully. Nothing new that I didn't know, mm -hmm. but this is a perfect wrap up of all of that. Cool. Uh, so check that one out. Hopefully it gets a release as well as It's Only Life After All. One of the big premieres coming out of the premiere documentary section about the band Indigo Girls. Yeah. It's a pair that went through a lot of BS growing up, not just because of their orientation, their sexual orientation, not just because of the style that they had, but because they got to be the butt of jokes to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was a solid look at their lives. It's 123 minutes, so you get the whole two hours. And besides looking at um, their journey up, seeing them talk about their relationship, mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting. How one of them felt they forced the other to do things they may not have wanted. How they were kind of approaching uh, all the ups and downs that they went through. Even being willing to look back and be like, yeah, plays an interview. I kind of messed up there. I like that. So nice. I, I, I'm not the biggest Indigo Girls fan. Yeah. I've known of them. They've been in several uh, cameos and been used a lot in pop culture. But yeah. I thought it was a pretty solid doc for their story. All right. So let's talk about the, the rented section, right? Yep. This is a section where I definitely think you need to watch these at least by the end of the year because there's something special in these movies that even if they may not may, have made our top 10, mm -hmm. 12, 13, whatever we have, there's a chance it may make it to yours. These are a lot of the movies that are like at the top of my, I just wished I caught them and I didn't. 
find the time. You should have caught this one right yeah. here. Nam Joon Pike, Moon is the Oldest TV. This man, Damia, created YouTube. Mm. Uh, this is produced and is narrated by Steven Yoon. So already off the bat, yeah. we're checking out. They've been working on this one for a while. And it looks back at this guy who created uh, the television idea of every artist in the world having their own channel. Mm. They get into this concept of how uh, Adolf only had a radio with one knob because he felt that that's all you needed a box to tell you something. And he's like, no, no, no. If we had different channels, everyone could create something interesting. He really started live streaming early on when he found out about satellites. And he's like, wait, we can ping these to several people. This man was an artist through and through. One of the lines that they say was, all the money he made got invested back into it. So he was perpetually poor. That word, perpetually poor, that was the funniest thing in terms of this artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a very interesting look at him as uh, an individual, him as someone who was creating these different forms of art, and then just how he really guessed YouTube before it was YouTube. Um, highly recommend this one, beautifully edited as well. Nice. So check this one out if you have a chance. Um, the Stroll, this makes a really good companion piece with another documentary that is gonna be in our top 10. Coke and um, But I know you got to, did you get- No, I only caught like a little, a little bit, bit of this of it. one, yeah. Um, it is mentioned in Kokomo as well. This yeah. one won, uh, I think you have, whatever it won from the Sundance Awards. Uh, yeah, it won the U.S. Documentary Special Jury Award for Clarity of Vision. This one, it's a, about the history of transgender sex workers who lived and work in New York City's meatpacking mm -hmm. dist district, which, you know, also I'm sure gets into like the way that the, the city has changed and gentrified yep. and pushed a lot of this type of community out. Yeah, uh, it comes from Zachary Drucker, who did Transparent, The Lady at the Dale, so they worked a lot on trans stories. Kristen Lovell has worked on Random Acts of Flyness, because I believe Ooh. this is co-directed, um, but specifically produced A Garden Left Behind, which I think was a really fantastic movie out of South By. Mm -hmm. um, this will be, yeah, it's pretty solid in, in terms of letting you know how a location itself can be targeted knowing who frequents that location. Absolutely. Um, so The Stroll, I'm not sure exactly who picked this one up, but it did have an award, so there was a chance to catch it if you had the awards category as nice. well. This next one was one where it was a special screening about Stephen Curry, <laughs> who's not even retired yet, who just won. Ain't underrated, yeah. but he called it underrated. Stephen Curry underrated. It's a documentary about Stephen, Stephen Curry. Curry. Uh, He's it, underrated. He is underrated. I didn't even know that that was what his, uh, <laughs> his, his merch is underrated. Oh, really? Yeah. I, that, I had no clue, but you got, you got to brand the whole thing. Okay. Uh, so he showed up and he got booed right off the bat. Is he the <laughs> least underrated individual? Like I, I just yeah, kind of. I mean, when you are there were, right, Steph haters? I don't know any. Steph there is haters. no Steph haters because yeah. there's no Steph lovers. He's the only one the guy. people who try to get his autograph. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> he's the one guy who's like so close to actually getting up there yeah. with MJ's records, <laughs> but no one really talks about that. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get the love. So he thinks he's overly getting the hate. Yeah. He doesn't. He's yeah. right in the middle. And honestly, that's sometimes the best place to be. Exactly. You're getting everything you want. You got a beautiful wife. You got beautiful kids, all who appear in the documentary. <laughs> um, and you have a, a great story to tell. Yes, he's a skinny, not the tallest basketball player. And it kind of uh, reflects on his early years in college. And that one year where they almost made it, he was you know, just completely underrepresented and everyone was throwing him down. Yeah. And then contrasting that with obviously everything that he wins. It's a little uneven because you spend this two hour documentary focusing on his college years and then kind mm -hmm. of a little bit in the in, in the present. Yeah. But you can tell like after he wraps up that college year story, oh, by the way, I won this year, this year, this year, this year, this year, and then right. here's how we won immediately. And I'm like, bro, you made this documentary on that last win when everyone was doubting you. When you won, you realized all these cameras, this is my last dance moment right here. <laughs> when he won that last one is when he realized, yeah. I wanna make a documentary. He's been producing Holy Moly. Mm -hmm. He's been producing, uh, Stuff that has gotten Oscar nominations, the one where the kid broke through the ice, that oh. Christian movie, that was him. That? He was a producer. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people in the NBA space are trying to get into the movie space as well. And uh, Steph, Steph is using what he's got to... He's close to LA, but there's another man closer to LA. <laughs> he's been producing too many movies yeah. oh. and appearing in them. So I just kind of feel like if I, I want a Steph Curry career a documentary after he's done with his basketball that, career. Too. Yeah, this right. is a Steph Curry documentary, but it's not the Steph Curry documentary. Yes. It's real. I called it a Skip Bayless disc. <laughs> he does not show the man's face. He just shows him complaining and then shows him proving him wrong. That's what the documentary is meant for. Uh, but it comes from homeroom director, Peter Nix. We really ah, like this guy. Sundance he, alum. I uh, was able to see him. Um, Seth, I think, also produced this movie. Mm -hmm. But Ryan Coogler was there as well because they're all directors who have worked at the Bay. 
uh, in the Bay Area, for the Bay Area, around the Bay Area. He specifically has a trilogy, The Forest Waiting Room and Homeroom. We've mentioned in the past, I, I like all of those movies, they're yeah. really good. And obviously he was going to be the person to be chosen to do this documentary. Uh, he got his, I know he went back. His mom was like, I, got, I know you got the gold awards, but how about a gold diploma? <laughs> Never got his diploma in the documentary. is also about him going back to school during COVID. It got picked up by Apple. You'll see it on an iPhone soon. Absolutely. Next up is Five Seasons of Revolution. Zach didn't get to catch this one, but it was a part of these really big documentaries in the middle of war-torn yeah. states, countries. This one's interesting because it follows Lena, one name, a documentarian, really journalist, camera person, who doesn't have a real name and neither do any of her colleagues. The whole thing is done in secret when she's meeting with people. There's, you know, you gotta make sure, is that person for real? Are they in with you? Are they an op? What's gonna happen? A lot of the people she's meeting with have these Snapchat filters on their face, so you never even get to see them. Yeah, you were saying it reminded you a bit of Welcome to Chechnya, how they do the face. Well, that, that, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. best version of that technology, right. but yes, it did. Uh, and it's an interesting story because she's going through, she's counting it through seasons, mm -hmm. the five seasons that she's over there trying to get into these different spaces. I really liked it, and this is one of those, because we're watching so many documentaries, I have it lower yeah. because we saw stuff that was incredible. Mm -hmm. But really, this one uh, on a rewatch might go even higher. And I'm very curious to see a lot of the other stuff that she's done because she's been overseas for 10 years, dude. This one also was produced by Laura Poitras, right? Poitras, yeah. Citizen Four. Absolutely. Uh, also got, did she get a nomination this year for? All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. It's the one non-Sundance movie that made it in. <laughs> so now she's here producing a Sundance exactly. movie. There's a chance this might make it in. She's made fantastic movies. If she's producing, you know it's going to be good. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to revisiting this one, but definitely one to have on your radar. Five Seasons of Revolution. Another one is Twice Colonized. Yeah. This is a personal tale on uh, Aju Peter. She is a woman who is fighting for the rights of indigenous people, but looking back at what got them to the position that they were in. This mm -hmm. one's interesting because there was a movie that you like narratively that didn't invade physically, it invaded economically. Right. She's looking at like, yo, you fake gave us our independence. Mm. It's the biggest Greenland diss track of all time, bro. Let me pull up some of the notes that I had over here. She's a very interesting individual. And we had a lot of those where you're following someone's perspective as they're speaking for a people. Giovanni's going to be one where I thought right. mastered that. This one was really good from that perspective as well. Um, because she's speaking uh, half in English and in indigenous language, not half, in thirds. Uh, yeah, and she's Dutch. Anyway. Yes. She starts like... <laughs> I love how she uses Dutch as a form of an insult. Mm. They're like, they reveal something to her and, and they go, you seem angry. And she responds in Dutch. She's like, no, I'm just acting Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> it's this idea of like realizing that people need a unified group and indigenous groups don't. Mm. They're all from different tribes, right? Unless we say the word indigenous, what's the flag for it? Right. What's and the it's, language it's for hotly it? debated. And yeah. because of that, there's not this group that can unite together to yeah. unify. And I thought the movie did a really good job of breaking that down. So, twice colonized. The idea of how are you getting colonized secretly without you even realizing it after you were given your freedom. Definitely put that one on your radar. As well as the winner of this year. The eternal Ooh. memory came yeah. in and scooped up. I'm sure you'll pick it up right now. I'm assuming it's the world cinema one. I think, because... yeah, it was the grand jury prize winner for world cinema. Man. Um, and I, this is one of the ones that I've heard is a potential Oscar contender it's, it's down in. the line. It's in, easily. First of all, it comes from the director who did, uh, a couple years ago, The Mole Agent. My yeah. Verdi, dude. Which I think Mole Agent got in the Oscar I'm nominated. pretty sure Mole Agent made it in. If not... Yeah, it, it was at nominated. least shortlisted. Got nominated, okay, it cool. didn't win, but yeah. That alone is worth watching this. Yeah. Then on top of that, a little director called Pablo Lorraine decided to produce a couple of movies, <laughs> and I think this was the best produced one that he did. Mm. The Eternal Memory follows uh, a couple, one who was a reporter, one who was an actress, and even got involved into um, the government for cultural reasons um, in the arts. Getting to the point in their life, I think 25 years, down the line. Yeah, they've been in a relationship for 25 years. Where the husband is now starting to forget things. And yeah. it's her just taking care of that person. The, the, the director pretty much said, I believe the world would be a better place if everybody took like one year, not to go fight in a war or to pick up guns, yeah. but to actually go and take care of another individual. Exactly. That would change everybody's Cause, life. Because the husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So like the plot line of the documentary says both of them fear the day he no longer recognizes her. And you know with That's a good. film like that, especially when you're talking about a documentary where you can't like make it, give it a happy ending, like they're, they're, it's gonna be like a countdown to some Just devastating 
moment. <laughs> yeah, easily. So uh, definitely check this one out if you're curious. It's also a really good mix of the director getting some, the wife recording the personal moments. Because mm. is there sometimes like you're just in their house recording them? Yeah. No, she set up the camera because she herself was in the arts. Um, and then the husband, dude, it's really, the director shot some of it, the wife shot some of it, and the husband had home footage. So mm. he shot all of his stuff back when he remembered it. It's good. Uh, again, the big winner memory. there. Eternal memory. Keep that one on your radar. Wrapping up the top three. Zach got to see these, so I'll let you take them away right here. All Starting right. Starting off with the disappearance of sheer height. Yeah, the disappearance of sheer height. You got to see the world premiere of this one, too. Well, I didn't even know it was the world premiere. I just waitlisted, <laughs> got in there. Uh, right afterwards, they gave us this bad boy yeah. at the race. So. 10 feet from Dakota Johnson. Oh, my. We rushed up there, bro. It looked like we were going <laughs> to tackle her. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Dakota Johnson there because she not only produces this one, she narrates it. And yeah, she does. Uh, a lot of her narration is taking letters that Sheer Height wrote and then giving voice to them too. And it, I actually like, at first I was like, oh, they just got some celebrity voice. They got someone who kind of sounds really no, like her. No, I forgot that it was her narrating. It flows so well. Dude, they yeah. have the balls to go from her fully speaking in, mm -hmm. a, in an interview to then her narrating. Like cross dissolve. Seamless. <laughs> they both got that thing where like they don't, so, it doesn't feel like they're always at full volume. Yeah, even yeah. when they're yelling at you. Exactly. They're yelling at you in a really <laughs> untense way. Yeah. yeah, the way that you don't want your like mother to talk she to you. She also had a fantastic like moment in the Q&A <laughs> where someone was walking out and she's like, I think he has a question. Nope, just leaving. Okay. <laughs> she, it was an honor to see her life, yeah. to see her work like that. The documentary yes. follows Sheer Height, who wrote the best-selling book in the mid-70s, uh, The Height Report, which was basically her uh, anonymously polling lots of men, lots of women about their different like sexual desires and yeah. feelings and experiences. And it's this thing where it, be, prior to this, many people hadn't done those kinds of surveys or done them in that kind of way. So First BuzzFeed poll. Exa <laughs> exactly. And the, so... Uh, she became this figure who revealed a lot of yeah. inner desires and, and feelings that people maybe weren't ready to confront or, mm -hmm. or, or accept. Yeah. And a lot of this documentary really focuses on the reaction to her naming these things that we understand rather than necessarily like the, the things themselves. It's a pretty fascinating look at not only like what uh, the, the documenting of uh, people's sexual desires, but also the people's discomfort at like accepting certain that aspects of they it. just refuse to be like yeah. I, I don't i don't think this is true uh it it, it, only it doesn't a, apply to me it so it can't apply to be me. also like the study it only had 100 people <laughs> this other one also had 100 people and you love that one yeah it, she's really quick on her feet as well which i thought was really great to see and it's not really her disappearance it's yeah. her story yeah. it's a really great title but the disappearance part isn't it, it gives you maybe like a false like, expectation when it's more of a bit, yeah. more of a like self yeah removal but, but in terms of one of those documentaries where you're going back and i believe this is an nbc one don't quote me on that it's got either going to be cbs or nbc which means peacock yeah you'll have it up there uh that team really did their work in going back and getting a lot of these archives and then like you said the narration is great uh, it's also produced by rj cutler a documentarian I, I think is really good he a lot of people thought his documentary his upcoming one was going to be here ended up producing instead you got nicole Noonan. do you know what she's done Crip Camp, probably uh, one of the biggest docs to come out of Sundance sense. a couple of years ago. Made it all the way to the Oscars as well. So uh, I see this one as being something that's going to have some legs uh, leading up to awards season. And honestly, it's a really good breakdown on sheer height. Now I got to read both of her books and that third one too that she had. <laughs> uh, next up is Bad Press. Yes. Another winner. The U.S. documentary special jury award winner for freedom of expression. I want to close some of these over here. Uh, bad Press. Yes. yes. This one was also in the U.S. documentary, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. we love the special jury awards because it's like they come up with whatever. Because it's a special jury. They get they to make it up on the spot. They give a prize for whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We will have our own intercut special jury. Um, freedom of expression, easily. It's like that's what the whole premise of the movie is about. This idea that who can control the news. And at, at that point, there goes elections. Mm -hmm. There goes... Uh, just the whole control of what the narrative is in the town. Yeah, because this documentary did reveal something that I had no idea about, but makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. That because uh, indigenous reservations on this in this country are not technically part of rights, the United yeah. States, they don't have freedom of the press. So, and 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 I think the statistic from the documentary is of the nearly six hundred 
uh, reservations that are in the U.S., only five of them have laws protecting the press. So really Damn. incredible that they, uh, you know, that this is a that large of an issue that yeah. hasn't really been. I mean, I guess who's there to report on it? That's the whole but, point. Yeah. And, and yeah, and I think <laughs> it's up, bro. it's it's a great journalism doc because it's partly about the. Uh, the work that goes into reporting and the importance of that reporting, mm -hmm. but it's also about the obstacles that are in the way, particularly in this case, the obstacles that politicians can uh, yeah. put in their way. And while like it is specifically about uh, the, what is it? The um, Muscogee. Uh, Muscogee nation. It, it is something that you can see ripples of in larger yeah, society because yeah. there's any powerful figure does yes. not want to have uh, transparency yeah. and, and journalistic freedom. That's a great point because Amanda really liked this one and she was like, nah, this is the stuff that's happening in Canada all the yeah. time. That's a huge thing in Canada because they, they, that new Canada law about you can't broadcast or stream things if it doesn't benefit Canada. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's a, that's a great way uh, to put it that way. It's one of those docs where you're looking at this specific town, but it applies to so much more. Totally. Bad press. Wrapping up, almost damn near in our top doc, but we yeah, already have probably too many could have been in there. Uh, you know what, Zach? If ten was thirteen well, let me, instead. Let me message the producers here. We yeah, I got. Right. I just got. We can put it yeah, in. Cool. Still a Michael J. Fox <laughs> story, making it in the top thirteen. Yo, we were we were expecting this to be so by the numbers. Yeah. And it was like by the numbers, in folded in, and just taking advantage of that. Talk about the editing. Exactly, like it's we, so good. We're always skeptical when you talk about these bio docs. We've, we've already dissed on bio docs in this. Yeah. This is definitely like an elevated, much more clean version of it. The yes. editing, as you mentioned, does this thing where, first of all, it's based on Michael J. Fox's memoirs, right? Mm -hmm. So you're taking a lot of his own words, interviews with him, and then interpolating it into the story of Michael J. Fox. But then in order to help sell you on how he feels, they pull from a career lived in TV and Crazy. film and take clips from, uh, I always mix it up as a family ties or uh, uh, shoot. I can tell you right now. <laughs> but keep going. But, but they take clips from Back to the Future. They take clip, clips from all of his films and use those moments when his character is saying like, oh, I'm tired or oh, I'm working too hard. And they do it to underscore how he was feeling at that point in his life. No, bro. The way that you put it was like, they didn't just find stuff. It felt like they time traveled back in time <laughs> to get him to say it specifically. Yeah. Like, that's how good they were in in going through his footage and sifting through. Because it's not just like the, oh, I'm tired. It feels like that's exactly what he said yeah. about the scenario in the documentary when they're, when they're talking about it. Uh, yeah, no, the editing was fantastic. And it's also does, Michael J. Fox show. <laughs> that's what it's it also does a really cool thing because like, I think whenever you do- Family uh, Ties. Family Ties, yeah. When you ever you do a bio doc like this, like you have to include the footage. You have to show the things that people know them for. But rather than just like, show a random should. clip for no reason. reason they show clips that like literally go with the story yeah and then you get a montage of like so much of the stuff that he did mm -hmm. um it also reminded me a lot of the val doc in where he had yeah. no problems sitting yes. there going like and it plays with the title i don't want to spoil it but he pretty the way much, that they tie the title in is very very yeah it's beautiful. pretty good he looks back at his life and he realizes all the stuff that he did wrong as well and uh yeah no uh, it was also really uh Fun to see him at the premiere for You Hurt My Feelings, which we had mentioned. I know yeah. there's videos out that, uh, of that out there. And uh, we had made a connection about them working together in something. So there was a specific reason why he was there. And it, w it made that moment really special. Yeah. But it was cool to see that he was going around in the festival. He was there for his premiere. He was there for uh, a lot of the Q&As and press stuff that he was doing. So uh, I I'm rooting for this one. It's coming out on Apple TV. Also, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. It's an Apple TV one at 95 minutes for a man with this big of a career. They really crunched in. I was mm -hmm. very impressed with what they did. I feel like of the personal documentaries we saw like this, this is the one that maybe has a chance to kind of resonate beyond, and partially because people do really, really love him, yes. but it's also really well executed. It you is. Know? Uh, comes from David Guggenheim. He did a little movie called An Inconvenient Truth. Yep, not did, exactly uh, a rookie documentary. Yeah. He is not at all. Worked on Training Day. And it also has a producer of Summer of Soul. Boy State, a thousand cuts, time, where's my Roy Coin? Mm -hmm. We're gonna be seeing more of this movie. So yeah. still a Michael J. Fox story in our top 13. Yeah. We are now in the documentaries where before the year ends, these are the films that we feel you need to add on your watch. You'll list. be missing the discussion. Yeah, like I can guarantee you, there's 13 out of here. Half of them 100% will hit. Yeah. 50% of the time. But <laughs> for sure, one of these movies is bound to be one of your top documentaries. Yeah. Here. 
Zach, against the Titans. These next two, I don't think you've, you've been able to see. No. So I'm pitching them to you. Zach, cool. please watch Against the Tide. I know. There is a movie that just got nominated this year at the Oscars, uh, the Burner one. Uh, All That Breathes. That was able to cover two brothers who were uh, taking care of these birds over in the Middle East. This is about fishing and two brothers who are trying to keep everything at bay uh, without compromising what they believe in. There is this... Um, you know, they have the case system over there. And because of that, you could see them be bound into this thing. Like, just pray to God and everything mm -hmm. will be answered. And you got this mother figure who's like, you just got to be patient. Nah, ma'am, you waiting at home, he's going out to fish. Right. And it's this idea of like, he's got so much debt. Is he going to do this thing called LED light fishing, mm -hmm. which would ruin his career? Mm -hmm. Or keep doing this form of old traditional fishing mm -hmm. that isn't helping. So you don't just have the struggle. You have this faith part of it. But you also have this new ways versus the old ways thing. I thought it worked really well. This one also won an award. Yeah, it was the World Cinema Documentary Special Jury Award winner for Verite Filmmaking. filmmaking. Yep. They got that down. I think it's a very good documentary. It's a reason why it's in our most watch list. And uh, yeah, I hope that people get to catch this one because again, you don't have to be a fisherman to see the struggle that he's going through. Yeah. Um, and he's such a good dude. Like he's such a good guy. That's why you're rooting for him. Was this the best documentary sub t uh, talking on matters of climate change, in your opinion? King Cole had some of it, but it wasn't necessarily as focused on the climate change as more the industry. Yeah. I would, I would say Because there's so. usually a good one every year at Sundance. Yeah. It's so good that you don't even see that as being the, the front thing. So, yes. Right. Yes. Nice. Against the Tide, part of the World Documentary Competition. The next one, also part of the World Documentary, is the personal essay doc I was telling you about. Yes. Millis Husando. It is so intriguing how they're, how she's able to go from what is a recap of her life, admitting that she lived in an apartheid South Africa, but she was good. Mm. She never felt it really. Mm -hmm. She just grew up fine. Bro, take it out of South Africa, go to Mexico, go to America. How many times does that happen? Where outside of your bubble, everything is terrible is happening but you're good yeah. how do you break out of that to realize just because it didn't affect you there's something bigger at play there she goes from it being a personal doc to just stopping the doc and for like 30 minutes going all just full archives <laughs> to show you the the history of apartheid right when she was in that section i thought this was damn near i transcended it was like a five out of five doc from there wow. she comes back and does this weird thing where it becomes a personal moment between her and her friends and it's their conversations that are shot, just audio. Hmm. So a bit this, of like an almost mixed media approach to the look, story. Yeah, she said growing up, they would only watch seven movies a week from the local rental store that they had there and that this movie came to her in her dreams. Hmm. I really love the approach that she Hell had yeah. here. Beautiful poster. Uh, and like I said, this is my favorite personal essay doc of the festival. Very cool. Mila Suthando. I just, I, I come out with, with this. <laughs> it's very, very good. I hope people get the chance to see this. Nice. Very good work. Let's get into the top 10, Zach. This was Ooh. your most anticipated week. Yeah. Give a shout out in the preview. Shout out the PR people. Yeah. Uh, some of you have really good PR filmmaking teams. Y'all are going to make it places. <laughs> some of y'all need to change those people. But shout out to the team for Smoke uh, Sana Sisterhood. You put it at the top. They got us an early link. And it delivered, dude. Absolutely. This was the first film of the films we got to see before the festival that I, w really hit for me. That I was like, all right, this is going to be one of the ones that we keep talking mm -hmm. about. And, you know, it's not necessarily a film that's like going to announce itself in a big way. But I, even from the title, even from the plot description, like it, it gives you a vibe and a feeling. And I think it really delivered on that. Uh, the film, of course, Smokes on a Sisterhood about uh, this group of women who come together in a... Uh, sauna and just sort of talk and have therapy sessions That's, with each yes. other. But it's also just this really brilliantly put together film in that the way that the camera moves and what it chooses to focus on, there, there's very little focus on women's faces as they're talking. Yes. It's it's different body parts. It's a lot of naked bodies too. Uh, but they, what they're doing is it's naked bodies delivering naked truths, right? Yes. It, it's, it's this really interesting thing where by kind of disembodying the voices 
and using the women as sort of representational figures for maybe womanhood. It, it's less about like, this is this one person's story and this is like many people's story. This is the, the story of being a woman in some ways. And I thought that was really profound and really moving. And there's a meditative quality to the film too. Mm -hmm. It ended up picking up the best directing award from World Cinema Documentary. Right, and I, yeah, absolutely uh, merits it. So it, it's a really fascinating exploration mm -hmm. of just like, the experience of being a woman and, and, and what the and the way that they communicate the, these stories I think is just so deeply felt. It yes. really does feel like listening in on therapy. It really is. You're, you're just a part of the group there. The director, Anna Hintz, uh, has worked on other features before like Port Tomorrow, Paradise Arrives. I find it interesting because she calls herself an active dumpster diver. Not an ex. <laughs> active. Uh, and she made a really good movie here. I agree with you, Zach. And I like Gillette about you. Thank I haven't you. liked it yet, but I did like it. You, you just gotta give it time. It. I did appreciate it. Right? <laughs> Smoke Sauna Sisterhood. One of the best documentaries in the fest. Definitely put it on your radar. Alongside one of the most intriguing and best yeah. of ones. Iron Butterflies from the yes. World Documentary. Talk about another it. one of the ones that really hit for me before they even before the festival even started. Uh, the title referring to butterfly-shaped shrapnel <laughs> that was found in the body of Flight oh, MH17, what the uh, Malaysian Airlines flight. Which that, one? Uh, that the, crashed. That's the in, one that disappeared, the one that crashed right at, In Ukraine, yes. Insane how close those two were. Exactly, yeah. Um, but like what it is, is it sort of gives you all these different piecemeal responses to that flight crashing. There's news footage being used. There's yes. children's drawings being interpolated. There, there's a dance troupe sort of acting out responses to things. And in this weird mixed media approach that doesn't really have like one, it's not it's not giving you like one message, it's giving you a lot of messages. Yes. You get just the feeling of the chaos that kind of unfurled from this thing happening. That not only the pain that the families felt, but the international uh, political ramifications and the spin. And it's just a really fascinating way to look at a real world event. This was really good. Yeah. Because it's also only 84 minutes mm -hmm. and it gets into the people on the ground level who yeah. thought they were heroes, mm -hmm. which is really scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and just the way they document them and make themselves believe, no, 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 it was a there was an attack. That mm -hmm. plane was not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the way I can't even open this one. This has got me a little concerned over here. Because <laughs> just so y'all know, Sundance did get hacked in 2017 <laughs> for making a Russian doc. Yep. And I'm trying to pull up exactly what Zach was describing. And the trailer was there. And now it's private. Uh oh. <laughs> so before this list goes private, let me just say yes, it does it in a fantastic way of looking back piece by piece to really put together what was happening. I, I then went to the Wikipedia and it scared me even more because you think certain people are hiding things and they're all like hiding things together. Mm. It really, like, really, really worries me in terms of, honestly, it just scared me that everybody involved in this or who could have been involved with this is making accusations or not making the right accusations um, for, for whatever reason. Yeah. All, all I know is that this is an adjacent doc to a lot of bigger issues at play, mm -hmm. and it, it does a fantastic job because we also talked about last year's movie that was played also uh, this yes, year. Yes, Klondike. They, they Klondike. brought that back for a like an encore screening. They brought that, that back for a couple films that didn't get to have their big Sundance premiere last year, really? like Summer uh, Summer of Soul, Soul like Coda. Coda. Uh, but I'm really glad they brought back Klondike because I think it's been an overlooked film from mm -hmm. Sundance last year. Won the Grand Jury Prize for World Cinema. And it also surrounds the downing of this flight. and Through this lady's house! Yeah, but it's, it's really, it kind of, both films sort Crazy. of accentuate each other because like you see, Perfect double feature, the, yes. Yeah, the, the the narrative version, and it's like, wow, is it what was it really like that to be on the ground? And then you see what it was like on the ground. It's like, yeah, it's literally just in the middle of this like village. It's yeah, it's so messed up how that happened. Yeah, there were just bodies that got sprinkled around. Uh, look, watch Klondike, watch this one. Uh, the director Roman Liubi also has Warno, a doc made up of just found footage shots mm. off of the Ukrainian soldiers' bodies. I gotta watch that. So a lot of really great stuff there. Iron Butterflies, fantastic documentary. Very cool. Moving up, the winner of Best Editing, the Jonathan Ooh. Oppenheim Award, goes to Going Varsity in Mariachi. Yeah. A movie that I ended up catching like several different links to it. Um, and it was really good. Uh, I like how Caitlin put it. She said, this is like a, a version of Cheer, where you're following the best of the best in the yeah. school. You know, it's it's already predestined that this was the school that was going to be followed. Exactly. And you're picking like which students are the ones who 
kind of need to boost up their 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 practice All, others are dealing with kind of cultural stuff mm -hmm. in their community uh within the school are they going to be able to make it to the next level right i really like the coach in this he's the one who holds it together and is really pushing these kids to make it um great music great editing like we said and uh, it takes place in texas and it uses texas full on yeah. one of the directors alejandro vasquez had a south by southwest short the, that we gave a shout out to folk Frontera, also dealing a lot with music. Mm. And it's produced by Papa Miranda, Luis, Luis A. Miranda, senior. Mm -hmm. So Pops, Pops is on there as well. <laughs> Definitely gonna get a push with this one, uh, especially after getting an award. Yeah, it reminded one that uh, Jonathan Eibenheimer did an award, as you mentioned. Uh, it reminded me a lot of the film that won it two years ago, which we already mentioned, Homeroom, in that it is, you know, you all these different children, th these young adults, and their, their, you know, their pursuit of a higher... Uh, something and uh, cheer is also a very good comparison in that like it shows you how competitive and dedicated these people are to a thing that you might not think would or ordinarily merit that kind yeah. of competitiveness like I, I i see mariachi and i don't think like oh there must be like high schoolers in texas like killing themselves over trying to get great at this if there's a school there's kids <laughs> stressing over something. Exactly, but, but yeah i see what you mean the idea that it's like there is competitions for it yeah. there is a culture and a tradition that continues to get passed down and i think that's what makes the documentary really good because you're following these kids who aren't just trying to you know do football because it's the next thing mm -hmm. they're also seeing it as a way to keep their culture alive absolutely so, a very beautiful documentary uh with the awards that it picked up hopefully it gets a very solid release yeah the next one you did get to catch this right yeah please tell me i've caught the rest of our top okay, 10 we're cause good because there's, there's no way to talk about this movie yeah if you did not see the visuals to this king Cole. This wasn't even in the documentary section. So next. There, we're, we're pulling documentaries from Next. We're pulling documentaries sure. from World and US and from the premieres. Sundance scatters them across the map. But this was one that needed to make it into the top 10 regardless. Yeah. This is a movie that's looking at, uh, they specifically said it was like in Pennsylvania. All West the Virginia. Uh, it's yeah. the Appalachians. Yeah. yeah. So pretty much at this place, they worship Cole. It is their king. Yeah. And the way she breaks this down and looking at the history of uh, not just the town, but the community itself hosts events for it. People come in. That is their job. People leave. This is what they're known for. It runs everything in this town. And the way that she's able to get into the history of how it was set up to revolve around this, fascinating. The way that everybody grows up knowing that this is the thing that's going to lead them. And then also making it half of a documentary and then half um, sort of narrative, not fully like you were mentioning in the uh, Iron Butterflies one. But you have these two girls who she's kind of capturing in the background. One of them makes up the uh, the poster, which is beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of show you the influences of what's going on in this town. This has some of the most beautiful cinematography. Yeah. Man. I don't know what you thought about this one. I mean, I think it's got this really interesting, beautiful thing going through it in that they, they have these moments with this young girl and it's meant to kind of evoke like uh, the, the new generation coming in and seeing the remnants of what was once like this legacy, yeah. right? Because it, it, what, what is fascinating about it is seeing the cult of coal in these areas. They they have football teams dedicated like to it. it. Like they, I, the, the thing that really comes is the the let's all give a round of applause for our coal miners, like their servicemen yeah. or something like that. Which is like, if you know how vital it is to the in, the region, it obviously makes sense. It but shapes you. You don't necessarily like. I have never seen that kind of dedication to it or that that like the, the cold shoveling competitions and stuff like that. It, it's really just a, a peer into a, what feels like a foreign world, but it's so close to at least geographically where we are. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, beyond that, it's also got this really kind of like ethereal, like dreamlike quality in that it's sort of uh, the narration discusses and the, 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 the absence yeah. from the region and the the, yes. the way that it's sort of dying out, this yeah. culture. And... Clearly she's from there and it's super personal and she finds mm -hmm. a way, she calls it a myth. Yeah. I think it's the best way to put it. She's Absolutely. almost talking about it like it's happening in some place else. Isn't it crazy that they do this stuff with the rocks that they have there? Uh, I thought she did a really great job with it. King Cole, very short movie as well, 78 minutes. It's a breeze uh, and there's a fascinating way of telling a documentary about this, about this town. Moving on, we have... When, it's just all hits from here, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this one is... Oh, my goodness. 
Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni project, the movie where I thought ah, it's going to be one of those where we're following, you know, another individual, an iconic person. Mm -hmm. Because of that, it's one that was way down my list. And I'm glad you told me to make sure Bro, I, I came caught it. Home, I came home telling you, uh, Alina, I'm like, yo, this Giovanni lady is a G. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. It won the U.S. Grand Jury Prize for documentary. Rightfully so. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I mean, you know. I, I, sometimes with these profile documentaries, there's a worry that it's going to be too much like the Wikipedia page. And this is not like, this is really like about her, her message about her writings, about her poetry and, and trying to sort of like plot that out and, and give you like the feeling of it. And also you get a sense of like how her work has really resonated yep. with people too. I, it's also just the rare case where like we, there's so many profile documentaries out there and like they, you obviously want the interview with the subject, but sometimes the subject isn't that interesting or revealing. She is everything right. out of her mouth. It feels like a mic right. drop. When, when James Baldwin says, <laughs> I think you're pretty cool. You're pretty <laughs> exactly. Cool. Yeah. Like she's like an intellectual thought leader. She's yeah. somebody who is worth listening to. And I also really respect and love that they put it in the documentary there. The amount of times that she would get a question and be like, I don't feel like answering Bro, that. I got one. you right here. You, uh, they bring up something about her childhood and she says, you want me to go to a place that'll make me unhappy and I do not want to go back to a place where I can't do anything about it. It's, it's not, it's more than just a refusal to answer the question. It's like a An thesis statement yes. on her, her life. Right. And, and when you are able to like spit profundities that quickly, it's worth profiling you. It's, it's really good stuff. Not to put it this way, but you know, how, like everybody puts those little Insta Instagram captions. This is obviously better than that. Yeah. But even then, this is what y'all should be putting your Instagram captions on. There's one point where she goes, uh, you know, she gets really emotional. She goes, you know what? I pay for my car. I pay for my house. If I want to cry, I'll do that too. <laughs> uh, this is, she's just a badass. Yeah, I won't spoil her ending line about being in space, but it's, it's so fan good. It's fan-freaking-tastic. Going to Mars, a Nikki Giovanni story. There's the, the fact that there's something else above this in the U.S. doc competition mm -hmm. just showcases... Yeah. That we had a great year. I don't know if we said it on, on, a, on a recording yet. We've had a great year at Sundance. Absolutely. So let's talk about our one, two, three, four. Is it one, two, three, four, five? Top five docs. Yeah. We're in here. Zach, this one blew you away. <laughs> Last minute, fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. On the complete opposite side, Zach was able to catch this after its win. Beyond Utopia. Before you do, yeah. these numbers were insane. 4.2. It had a 9.8 coming out of the fest. Yeah, on IMDb. What resonated with you, man? Well, I mean, it's obviously a fascinating subject, right? Because this is uh, a documentary that takes hidden camera footage uh, from a high stakes escape from North Korea. And, and one of the obviously most uh, you know fascinating regimes and awful uh, places on earth, right? In and, comparisons and, to a lot of other <laughs> terrible regimes, yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's just a fraught, uh, edge of your seat nature to anything that depicting that kind of journey. Um, you really do feel like you're on the journey for lots of parts mm -hmm. of it, but it's also a documentary that has all these really interesting interviews, all these really revealing uh, glimpses of life in North Korea or what the experience of a North Korean is like, particularly the experience of a North Korean who is leaving the country too. Um, it's it, a lot of good movies. Like yeah. I, I just think it's, you know, a fascinating subject handled in a fascinating way. Yeah. Um, it's, it didn't end up being the top documentary for me of my list, but yeah. I know a lot of people who came away from Sundance people. thinking this Love was the this. best documentary there. It won the audience award for U.S. documentary. Good. People were like, this was also available online. It was one of the last minute editions. And yeah. they, out of all of them, you know, Steph Curry going to Apple, but no, not online for the fest. Mm -hmm. This one was. And I, I, to me, that says a lot. I appreciate that. Um, a lot of people love this one. I respect it a lot. I also have it high but not as high as some of the other ones we had it could be another thing of just seeing these other documentaries we're about to mention yeah. just taking it had, far and away had i not seen the vice documentaries in north korea i think i would have had this one higher it, i think that's what it is for me it's like yeah. the food and country thing where it's like yeah north korea is bad mm -hmm. <laughs> i knew that yep so this is like for the for the people who haven't seen that it breaks it down to a crazy degree uh junam has that longing of an immigrant who left a war-torn place there's a lady who does give a whole speech about missing home, regardless of what happened over there. It's what she knew. Um, my only thing with it, and it was interesting because the filmmaker here directed or edited 30 plus features, one of them being loose. One of my favorite Sundance ones. It was the editing 
that just took me a little bit. And I could be completely wrong. It's completely fine. Because that was one of the ones where I had told you guys, I'm like, this is really good. It's not up there with the best. But it's getting really rare reviews. Make sure you watch yeah. it. Uh, I feel like the music was very overbearing sometimes. Yeah. It definitely tells you how to feel in moments. That was my only thing. Yeah. People are loving this. Give it the give it the give it the watch. Uh, it may end up being one of your favorites because, as you said, it won some really big awards. Mm-hmm. The award winner that really stuck with me though was another world cinema documentary one, and this one won a special award, right? Uh, yeah. Which one did this one? Uh, it won the World Cinema Special Jury Award for Creative, creative Vision. vision. Love, love that one. Love to have a creative vision. <laughs> Yeah, because sometimes they don't have creative vision. So mm-hmm. when they do have one, it's really nice to see. We should give out our least creative vision. <laughs> <That> one, <laughs> this was so by the, by the numbers. Pretty do, baby. Do better. Uh, Fantastic Machine. It is also produced by Ruben Osland. Yeah. Academy Award nominee for there Best Director, go. Ruben Osland. Um, from uh, Force Majeure, The Square. What are you nominated this year? Triangle Sadness. Triangle Sadness. There we go. These two directors, I believe, are also from wherever Ruben Austin's from. So it is technically a world documentary. Mm-hmm. So it's completely narrated in a different language. Uh, let's see right here. Make sure I got it. Swedish. But th- all of the archival <laughs> footage is in English, yeah. French, German, Arabic, primarily English, really. Yeah, it's taking mostly like viral clips, but also a lot of like archival, archival stuff. clips. A um, uh, fascinating thing about this is that it's technically a quote. Yeah. The entire name. I don't know if you got it. I, I don't remember. It was one king of England. I forget which king of England. King I'm of really England. bad with English yeah. history. They, they brought him this box, showcased it to him. They filmed his coronation, maybe? And he was like, oh my gosh. And the, then the king said, what, what a, a fantastic, fantastic machine. machine. So the full name is, which I think is fire. Yeah. And then the king said, what, what a, a fantastic, fantastic machine. machine. If they release it under that title, I'll bump it up half a star. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think they did the Netflix thing where it's like, that's not the SEL title, right. but in the movie. I heard they made houses. Um, <laughs> uh and it does a great job, like you said, of showing you viral footage we've seen before, mm-hmm. but in a context where it really works. They have a moment in here where because it's called a fantastic machine, the point of that is that it's really getting into um, how we've commodified video. Every shot that we get, even this, it's to make money. Mm-hmm. That's what makes it a fantastic machine. It's the fact that you could record this and put it out there in this world and yeah. make money out of it from live streaming, from OnlyFans, from CNN. They mm-hmm. went at CNN worse than Andrew Callahan did. Uh, it, it does a really great job at showcasing how easily something in front of the camera doesn't matter. doesn't matter how much you know. As long as you're saying the right things, it could be someone you picked up off yeah. the street from an accident. But they also do a really good right. job of putting different shots in different contexts, right? Because they there's one bit that I really loved where they show an interview with uh, Lenny Riefenstahl, the woman, woman who shot Triumph of the Will, the Adolf Hitler speeches, okay. right? And they're showing her talking about her filmmaking techniques and how she tried to make this like grand, amazing moment. And then they cut the footage of uh, concentration camps and starving Jewish uh, survivors, yes. you know? And just to see the the juxtaposition of those clips speaks volumes to yeah. like, th- you know, the the how perverse it is to use cameras how in certain ways and the different feelings you can evoke. Mm-hmm. And so I think there are moments in this documentary that really, really kind of, they speak very loudly without speaking at you, right? Yes. The, the one where there was like, here's a tutorial on how to help you in a very perilous situation. And then the next video is, here's how to make a bomb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a really short documentary. It's under 90 minutes. It throws a lot at you, yeah. but I thought it was it was fantastic. We always sometimes mention, why would you show that influencer, that person? And they had this answer in the doc, not for that, but the idea of like, in the media when they showcase a mass shooting, murder, whatever mm-hmm. it is, there's always a psychologist that's telling you, don't do that. So the question was brought up to them. You have moments where you do showcase these people. How do you answer for that? And I think just like when they show the influencers, they gave a fantastic response of, in, in the right context, yeah. which this is, you are able to get into those pockets to talk about anything and showcase something because the context is in educating you. It's yeah. in breaking down, look at, I can't show you the pattern to look out for if I don't show you the pattern originally. Right, and when you Incredible. place a certain clip between a couple other clips, like you, there's a certain, you interpret that's it a, differently. Yeah, that's a big thing. Because I don't know if you know this about YouTube. We've dealt with this a lot of times. Uh, you know, on YouTube, you can get like a cover and thing and you get to delete yeah. it. So people have done that because it allows them to be like, I'm going to do, I don't know, something here, BS for 10 seconds, upload it, it's fine, cut that out, and then it allows me to create whatever the symbol is. Yeah. They know that. Uh, this movie knows that. It is a very good documentary looking at the world of film, which is really young. That's a big thing they push in there. It's 
It's not that, not that old. Fantastic machine, a fantastic movie. And our top three, oof, Kokomo City. Incredible, incredible doc. Another one that's not even in the three doc categories. It is in the next category where it won the Audience Award for the next uh, films. The next Innovator Award presented by some company. Uh, this movie is so simple. It is four sex workers, trans women, who are just filming a bathtub. Uh, there, there's some other people who are in the movie as well, but it's like on a bed, it's in black and white. They keep it super simple. Uh, and D. Smith in particular was a collaborator with a lot of rappers. Mm -hmm. uh, Shoot Me Down. It's also unlisted over here. But they did that music video with Lil Wayne, transitioned, asked somebody for a favor if they could buy them a camera, bought them a camera, shot this movie in black and white because they said it's, it's more elegant. Black and white movies, they're timeless. I feel that these women who are talking are telling you a timeless story. Plus, they're telling you truths, and nothing is more truthful than a black and white film. Not one Sundance. <laughs> I thought this was great. This is the best example of just sitting down and getting uh, talking heads, breaking down stuff for you. You were rewatching it, and I was trying to watch some shorts, and I was still paying attention to some of the sequences in this movie. Uh, this is a standout for me, easily in the top five documentaries of the best. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's not the only documentary to look at trans sex workers or, or look at this type of like oh so, but occasionally like marginalized overlooked community it's not even the only documentary in this festival no. to look at them but to, it's the only well. documentary i've seen to do it in this kind of stylish vivacious way that feels more like a celebration of life yes. than like a warning of a lifestyle it or doesn't something like feel that. like somebody was like oh those trans people over there look really interesting yeah. let me go get it's a story not, out of them nah. it's not condescending at because it's, it's the opposite it, it's it's really like putting these women up on a pedestal and valuing their stories and their mm -hmm. humor yeah. and, and just the, the the how candid they are with the documentary, like there's a it's lot funny. of things. It's, it's very funny it's because funny. it's so revealing and it's also like so honest. It's the kind of honesty that like you are never gonna get in like a real Thank life you. situation. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and to be able to get that kind of like glimpse, that that inner workings, I, I don't know, it's very, very cool. The fact I, they're just sitting there and it's invigorating. That's how that's how well what they're talking about hits. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps it vivacious throughout all of it. Yeah. Kokomo. I thought this was great. I mean, like it's, you know, especially when you talk about documentaries that do uh, profile marginalized communities, sometimes they can be such a like uh, such homework. And yeah. this is never homework. No. This is just telling you to shut up and listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, Kokomo City, absolutely fantastic. Put it on your radar if you have not. Um, as we move on to the top two, uh, it's. It, <sighs> <laughs> 20 days in Marapola, yeah. Zach having to take a walk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a... This man had to decompress. It's a hard one to, like, maintain our fun tone. I had to take a shower. <laughs> Zach, talk about 20 days oh, in Marapola. I mean, first of all, the Audience Award winner for World Cinema Documentary. So the people saw this one and were really affected by it. And I just don't know if there's any way to watch a documentary like this one and not be deeply, deeply affected by it. It... It takes place in Mariupol, a, a region of Ukraine, uh, one of the first ones that was uh, invaded by Russia, and it covers right on the, the border. Yeah, yeah, it covers the twenty days after the invasion began. It, it kind of one of the really interesting things about the documentary is they sort of give themselves this ticking clock with the title. You yes. know, they're spending twenty days there, and you see as things escalate and they, they, the situation grows more dire, they that they're cool. they're growing, they're getting closer and closer to danger. Um, so just by by framing it that way, you've already got this thriller element to it. But you're following these Associated Press reporters mm -hmm. who are there to try and cover what's happening on the ground. And uh, one thing that what, the thing that I thought was so fascinating about this film is how you see them get go out, get their interviews, take their uh, take their shots, get their footage and then disseminate that information to the world. They, yes. they will show you, so we went good. up here and uploaded the footage with our satellite phones, and then you'll see that footage playing on the BBC, on CNN, yeah. on you know some random country's yes. news footage. It, and it's so, so cool to just see the way that it, what they capture is then translated and inseminated to people. But it's also, you, you, you feel for them because they're in the middle of the, the most sad, 
uh, the the worst circumstances imaginable. Yeah. People having their lives and homes and bodies destroyed. That you know they show you a young child. <laughs> dying and then they show you a younger child dying and then they show you an even younger child dying Bro, I, like, I have pulled up probably one of the worst scenes that even re- like this se- I'm, I'm gonna move it from there dude yeah there is it is the atrocities that happen in this are so crazy that the director came out right here one of the best directors of the fest yeah. easily um and pretty much described it as this is a movie where if you don't realize what's happening right now in the future when we all come to it and realize why didn't anybody do anything to stop it? why didn't anybody tell us He's like, here is a film documenting everything that you should have known about. And it was out there. Because like you said, his images have gone out to the news. But then what he does in the doc is he contextualizes what was happening at that moment right before you saw that body on the news. He interacts with people as a documentarian shouldn't. And then really doubles on on why a documentarian shouldn't. It's it's a fascinating documentary. Yeah. And I love that he also includes the people who are calling him a prostitute and stuff like that too. Because it's like, I, I th- the it's really it's, valuable. It's invaluable yes. to have people on the ground there. But it is also exploita- exploitative. And, and, you know, to, to see... There's the people who are like, please document this. Please show the world. And then there's the people who are like, get that camera out of my face. Yeah, we're trying to survive yeah. during this wartime. Uh, the, the fact he addresses that I thought was was, was a really big deal. Um, and yeah, just that idea of keeping it as a record in time. He's gone out and he's talked about uh, how he's trying to get the movie out there. And hey, I hope it doesn't get cut or, or anything like that because I don't know who picked this up yet. And this is one of the biggest documentaries out of the festival. So 20 Days in Maripol, if you have not caught it uh, at the festival, it is one to definitely have on your radar because this is one I'm rooting for all the way towards the end of the year. Easily one of the biggest standouts of the festival. Yeah. Before we get into our number one, which we've loved all of these movies. Yeah. When I tell you this next pick is like so far up (laughs) in terms of our ratings, that's how good this movie is. We want to mention a couple of the other ones we didn't get to. Right. Uh, Starting off with Tuba Thieves. This was a link that we got sent. As you can see, the letterbox link. Don't even work over there. That's that's what happened to our screener. The Tuba Thieves is a movie about these tubas that went missing in Los Angeles. But then it turns out that's not what even that's not what the movie's about. It's supposed to be about listening and hearing and and individuals who are deaf and trying to get noticed out there. So this is one that I definitely have on my radar. It's yeah, we had planned to watch it at a certain time and didn't expect the link to not work on us. Yeah, so it, it the, sounds really cool. Sounds really interesting. It was also another documentary that's experimental and a part of the next category. Uh, some other docs, Deep Rising, which is uh, narrated by Jason Momoa, telling you to recycle. Uh, the Deepest Breath, I guess, telling you to They breathe. got Aquaman to do the <laughs> they underwater documentary. The, makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, but he is also, like, he's huge. All of his saps, he makes sure there's no plastic. He, he is he right. a man of his word. Uh, and then another one dealing with diving, decent. Depth I, I just didn't catch that one because I don't like the idea of not. Like, that. I know I would, <laughs> this my skin would crawl you watching the. this poster right? Oh, no, no, no. It's. One of my biggest fears is drowning. No uh, way, no way. And then speaking of expiring links, these were two that we were able to catch, but we did not finish them. So we're not counting them here, but I was really excited to catch a little Richard. Yeah. I'm everything documentary. Uh, very short, which I do not want to see. This is a man who deserves a miniseries, mm-hmm. but I heard it, it does a decent enough job with his story. Uh, and I believe that one did get picked up. So it might be streaming elsewhere in yeah. the future, as well as Piano Forte, one that comes from the director yeah. who last year made a movie that I believe may have won an award. Prime time. So mm. we're on Netflix. That was a movie that we actually felt would have been better as a doc because it was dealing with real life stuff. The narrative was okay. Yeah. This is a documentary where he is going through the thrilling world of these pianists who yeah. have to go through this very tense competition. I only got to see a little bit of it. And yeah, it is a very tense movie. Uh, I don't know how he was capturing them, how he was setting up the sound because it's a very sound centric movie, mm. but I commend him for all of that. Looking forward to finishing it once it's done. This had three sound people, just so you know how. Exactly. Like, that's the big part that's of this. That's the focus. Document. That's the focus right there. But I, I'm looking forward to this one uh, when it comes out, as well as Justice. I don't have that one pulled up over here, but that was yeah. a last, last, last Basically, minute. the only reason we didn't see it is they announced it, I want to say, January 19th, and it had two screenings on January 20th. And that's it. Nothing online. Nothing. Our schedules were already busy. We had, we were was already that like, in something. The world premiere of some ma- magazine yeah. dreams or something we like that. I don't know. Believe it to see a Brett Kavanaugh doc. Yeah. Spoiler alert: He not that great of a dude, <laughs> but it comes from Doug Liman. Doug yeah, Lyman that's the thing. I like director. Doug Liman. Yeah. Well, um, you you love Doug Liman. I. 
I, I think I like Doug, Doug Lyman more than you, but Doug Lyman's made a lot of good movies. I don't know if he's made many documentaries, any documentaries. I, I did hear that they were still getting new tips about Brett Kavanaugh. I don't want to see the documentary announced... in the works, bro. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. It does, it does feel like it's really in the works still. So. Um, would have been maybe cool to see how it is then and how it is now. It, it's not like a, I don't think it's going to be like the full thing. No. So maybe it's good we're not judging it yet. Yeah, so it was one of the last ones. We'll catch it when it's actually finished. Right. What we did catch was a movie that came from a director who Whew. previously did a film. Talk about the talk yeah. about his well, so first film. Yeah, 2019 was was that my first year at Sundance? It was your was first year at Sundance. My you first wouldn't year. let me leave until I saw this movie. <laughs> and we went to an award. Because you go to festivals like this hoping to have a discovery, right? Yes. Like we if Magazine Dream was going to hit, we knew it was going to hit. Mm -hmm. If You Hurt My Feelings was going to hit, we knew it was going to hit. Midnight so Family. Something comes out of nowhere. Yeah, from from first-time director, blew me away. It's this documentary that uh, profiles a family in Mexico that owns an owns and operates an ambulance. And, Independent ambulance. Exactly. And you, you get all this really interesting uh, immersiveness into the world of... Uh, the weird, in, the weird bits of Mexican healthcare where mm -hmm. there's privatized elements, and but it's also just this amazingly shot documentary that if you didn't tell me, I could have believed it was a narrative because all the shots look so perfectly framed and lit and and put together yeah. that it, the pacing is incredible. He shoots it. He shoots, edits, directs all himself, Luke Lorenzo. So I saw that first one and I was like, I was like, this is my guy. I'm going to watch everything he makes. He and announced a new one at Sundance, and it is our top documentary Easily. of 2023 at I'm, Sundance. I'm missing a half star right here. There Luke, we go. Yeah. A still small voice, just an incredible piece of filmmaking from Luke Lorenzen as he follows an aspiring hospital chaplain beginning a year-long residency in spiritual care, discovering the stress and, and insecurities and frustrations of that job. I don't think I've seen a more empathetic film in, in a long time. Just the amount of empathy he has not only towards all these uh, patients obviously going through moments that are maybe the worst of their life, maybe the end of their life. Uh, all these chaplains who are doing everything in their power to try and make their experience a, a little better, a little more uh, smooth, a little less painful. And then also the, the way that he follows that, that chain of anguish up through the chaplain supervisors up to the supervisor's yeah. advisor and how everybody's sort of looking for a place to dump their their upset their sadness their anger but the, the how how almost like it's it's like uh the guy rolling the boulder up the hill right there's always going to be more coming at you and i i was just blown away by this one he's that guy dude. yeah this is a movie about communication. Yes. You don't have to deal with anything in hospital. It is just a back and forth between a superior and someone who's trying to do their job and doesn't feel they're being hurt. Mm -hmm. She, like, we were hearing some like stuff. Some people didn't like her. They thought she was annoying. So I'd like to see you do this job for a year I, I, and I not be annoying. I don't, I don't understand that because they said this with her at the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, nah, she was a fascinating individual, someone willing to take the time, someone who, if you were in these scenarios like these families, you would want someone like her. Mm -hmm. Someone who takes the time to understand what your daughter's name is, how it's pronounced, the fact that she can switch from having the Christian values and words that people right. need to hear during a, a moment of turmoil, having her own background, which that, that whole she, speech she gives, mm -hmm, that she's about a, why she does what she does. That she's a Jewish atheist who is performing a baptism at some point in this film. <laughs> First, and there's even another word, but I don't want to put that in. It goes even deeper than that. No, she was. it was fascinating to see someone who doesn't want to compromise her work, someone who realizes that if she's not doing the work, who else will? Mm -hmm. Will they do it correctly? She's been in the scenario of what it's like to not have that person who's willing to make you feel better. Yeah. And how could she not be that for others? And what's so amazing is Luke Lorenzen is able to capture all of this while being a fly on the wall. You never really feel the presence of no. the camera, yet the camera's always in the perfect place. Yeah. The, the shots are so gorgeous and perfectly framed. Like they, it, it's, it's amazing how intimate he's able to get and how up close without feeling like he's ever intruding. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's stunning. It's really right. stunning work. And that baptism scene was the one tear mm. I had from. I mean, there might be one other movie, I didn't see, <laughs> but that one for sure. Yeah, it got the it got the Doc Award for making me cry, <laughs> and also got the uh, directing award from U.S. Right, documentary. Rightfully so. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I feel like we really respond to his style, and I don't know if like he's got that wider no. approval quite yet. So this but might he, not be. 
might not be like an Oscar contender. Absolutely should. Is, is Midnight Family not getting adapted into a series? Is it? I thought so. That's what I heard. <laughs> really? You, you want to Google that? I remember hearing that they were going to try to adapt it into something oh. bigger. If they're working on something like that, then it's only a matter of time before all those doctor shows that people like. Is it? Yeah, Apple. What? <laughs> this. You could adapt this. All right, get that back, People Luke. may not get the doc, right? Yeah. But if you can put it into a narrative, you're set. Yeah, and he's... he's. I Remember mean, when you used to have to read the book? Yeah, well, I got the doc. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's he, fantastic. There's, there's so much that you want in these films. And like, yeah, this is another one where if they did want to adapt it into a series, there's so much there. But you don't, you don't need it. Like, he's, he's got he's like got an amazing, amazing film. Um, and I think it's only a matter of time if he keeps making films like this that he'll really get onto the larger radar. For sure. I think it's very, very special. It's my, he's my favorite verite filmmaker working right now. Easily. Yeah. But those are all of the documentaries Ooh. from Sundance. Yeah. If you caught any of the ones that we missed, let us know. If you work for them, let us know. Uh, and which one was your favorite ones? Uh, what was your favorite documentary, special jury, creative vision? Yeah, what give out your, your own awards. Personal one, yeah. Let us know which ones resonated with you, what you're mm -hmm. looking forward to down below in the comments section. Uh, other than that, though, if you have not caught our best genre movies out of Sundance, go catch that. Our best drama movies out of Sundance, and as well as our Intercut Awards, we yeah, have all that, that list. That's coming up right next, but you probably saw it in the past. <laughs> yeah, it's the first out, but <laughs> it's the, the first last we recorded. Yeah. So until next time, definitely let us know your thoughts down below in the comments section, and we'll send you some royal call. <laughs>